check check one two check uh, ladies and gentlemen we are live the coffee and biscotti show i'm your host crew mel bellissimo it is friday september 24th 12 o'clock est and it's a beautiful friday here in the, our nation's capital and I got a great show for you today, my friends. So just to kind of let you know, we're having a bit of technical difficulty, but we are going to get our dear friend online soon. So where to begin, my friend? I'm going to say something to you. Of all the introductions that I've done, you know, my friend Putin Nation always calls it a, a blush troll. The truth is, guys, is that I've had a real difficult time deciding what it is that I'm going to do with this intro because this man is a retired police officer. He is, he spent three plus decades as a police officer and he is a, a he just completed an autobiography called Black Cop, which sort of goes through his life of being a, a, a black police officer and some of the trials and tribulations that he faced. In fact, I think it's quite timely that we're doing this episode today because of all of the things that we've heard and seen in the media when we talk about things like Black Lives Matter and, you know, uh, the former president, uh, you know, shining light, if you will, on some of the more difficult things to to accept it's sh it's sh he shined light on all the racism all the stereotypes um you know and it's it's something that uh is is of of real passion for me to talk about because i kind of feel like we're in 2021 and yet we still have problems that we've had for hundreds of years and I know that as, as, a, as a species, we're very slow in changing, but we need to, we need to, um, we really need to make some changes fast. And what I love about what our guest did is that he recounts his story about what it was like to be a police officer growing up from humble beginnings in Nova Scotia. Um, you know, he, he is, he's one of his, of course, the thing that he's most proud of when we spoke together is just this idea that he was able to walk down the road of his old community in the old streets of Halifax and hold his head up high. Because one of the things he's most proud of is, is that he's got an immaculate record with two different police forces. and. That's powerful to me, guys, because, I mean, again, you know, we're talking about two major things. We're talking about policing, which is, of course, always under scrutiny. Um, you know, there's always some kind of thing in the media about uh, uh, police and how uh, they're, they're, they've overused their power. Uh, and then there's racism, which, of course, is always in the news. So having our guest today come on the show is is really powerful for me and and it speaks volumes to you know let me put it to you like this what are we really looking for you know i talk about with my company decorous life i talk about that decorous means beautiful and and my last name is bellissimo so it's beautiful it means beautiful in italian that all we're searching for is a beautiful life The other thing is, what do we want to do? We all want to go home at the end of the day from our, from our uh, jobs and feel proud of what we've done. Feel proud of the time that we've put in at work. And that's why our guest today um, is like, it's really special to me to have because Having him on the show represents him taking the time to share something very personal, 
something very private about his life and about the challenges that he faced. You know, some of us will never experience that, those kinds of challenges. We may have other challenges, but we may not have the challenges that uh, our guests faced. So what I'm going to do now, guys, is before I bring him on, I just want to make sure that uh, he's with us. Calvin, are you still there, brother? Yes, I am. Okay, so you're on my phone now. Can we switch you over to uh, Restream now? Because I still don't see you. I'm gonna bring you. I'm gonna bring you on, guys. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties. Calvin, can you see me or can you hear me? I can hear you, and uh, my picture is uh, on the right. Just, uh, what about now, Calvin? Can you hear me? Because we are online, and I got my phone on mute, so you don't hear me through my phone. Yeah, I can't hear you, Calvin. You're gonna have to redo this. Mr. Josh, thanks for helping out, brother. We're just having some technical difficulties on, on Calvin's end, uh, and we'll get him on here shortly. But, uh, you know, I just kind of want to share with you uh, that's with, that are with us today a little bit about what this guy's done, you know. Uh, you know, he was the 19th, he was crowned the heavyweight boxing champion in 1975. And he did that all on his spare time because he wasn't doing this as a profession. He had already become a police officer. So when he won the nationals, he was offered to go to the Olympics and the force wouldn't give him the time to go. So we're going to hear about these stories. We're going to hear about all the things that this man went through. So what I want to do now, guys, is, as we're waiting for Calvin to come, because like I said, we're having some technical difficulties. Calvin, are you still with us on the phone? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, I have a red screen of me and a black screen on the left. Okay, so hold on. Josh is letting me know. Ask him to try clicking the restream link on his phone. I can't connect to Twitch. Okay, guys. So, uh, Josh, can I just connect you? If you can hear me on the uh, restream, can you connect with Calvin directly? Is that a possibility? And what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll send you his uh, his contact. This way, it makes it a lot easier. Sorry, guys, this is what happens with uh, technology. I'm afraid that uh, <laughs> uh, it's not in my hands at the moment. You will zoom with him, okay? So, Calvin, what we're going to do is Josh is going to zoom with you. Yes. This way, he can help you uh, uh, go through it. Uh, let me just uh, let me just share your contact information with Josh, and he can uh, he can contact you directly. And I'll and I'll continue here, guys, live here on the show, and um, hopefully we'll we'll get this working sooner or later. But what I want to do for all those watching today, guys, is I wanna I wanna go through some of the stuff that that he sort of sent to me in terms of some of his accomplishments, some of his. Uh, uh, awards and things that he's uh, accomplished in in all the years. And to be honest with you, part of why I didn't put it in that post is because it's just too many. It, there's just too many things. It's really quite remarkable, uh, um, you know, because he's we. So his name is Calvin Lawrence, and I met Calvin through uh, my boxing coach. Uh, which we had here on the show, Richard Atkinson. And, you know, he's out here in Ottawa, and he actually knew um, uh, Nikki and, and her dad because they had trained together. But um, it's just amazing what this guy's done. So um, let me go through some of the stuff with you here live because it's actually quite quite remarkable some of the stuff he's done so uh he was the 1975 um canadian amateur heavyweight boxing champion 
1974 Nova Scotian provincial heavyweight boxing champion. And he was, of course, the 1976 Canadian amateur uh, Olympic contender. Um, he, he finished his book, his autobiography, uh, in 2019. Uh, it's a book called Black Cop. Later on, Josh will bring it up for us uh, once he gets this whole uh, technical issue sorted out. Um, he's written in books like You Had Better Be White by 6, uh, 6 a.m., the African-Canadian experience in the RCMP. Um, he was inducted into the Yarmouth Nova Scotia Sports Hall of Fame. I just and guys, this is this is like almost his CV. I'm I'm reading to you here. That's how much there is. Um, gave perspective evidence on bias, use of force, and racial issues at the Andrew Loku inquest shooting by Toronto Police. Testified at Canadian Human Rights Hearing. Maybe we got him. Maybe we got him. Gavin, are you with us? I am here. You're on the phone, but uh, we still can't see you online, my friend. Can the audience, audience hear me? No. Okay. They can only hear you because you're on my phone and uh, we're live. So they can hear you on my microphone. So Putin Nation says we're working on it. So if it's okay, Calvin, I'm just going to mute you on the phone. So I think that now's a good time as any, as we're waiting for all of this to happen, to speak a little bit uh, too about um, one of the things that I, I, I never do on the show, guys, is talk a little bit about what it is that I do. And so um, I want this show to be uh, sponsored by Decorous Life. And Decorous Life is my company and it's my coaching company. And I think it really aligns well with, with what we're talking about today because he's, he's just this all around super guy, but I work with clients and this is, this is, this is what, what Calvin told me. He said, he's the kind of guy that if you were ever in trouble or if you needed anything, he even said to me the other day, even if you need a ride somewhere, you just call me crew and I'll bring you wherever you got to go. That's what kind of guy we're talking about. But what I do with my clients folks, is, is I work on bringing awareness, balance, and clarity to one's life. And the people that I work with are those that are first and foremost heart-centered. So if you're heart-centered, then you're going to fit in perfectly with a group, a curated group of people that I've created here in Ottawa and all over Ontario called the Wolfpack. And I work with people that are in transition. Now, that's sort of a, a broad word when I say transition, because it could be a transition personally or, or, uh, or from a, um, a career perspective. But my point is, is, is that the people that I work with are going through something. And what I love about working with these kinds of people is, is that they're is that they're, they're, they, they've done something. Let's say, for example, they've been in a career for 15 or 20 years. Well, there may come a point, guys, where you say to yourself, is this, is this what I wanted? Is this, is this all that I'm going to do? Is this why I, my purpose here? You know, maybe you're used to working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And... Maybe you're ready for a change. You just don't know how to navigate through it or you don't know where to begin. And let's face it, folks, it's because for the most part, you're used to doing a particular thing. You're used to a, a particular routine. And what happens when that routine uh, changes? So that's what I, what I do. And I work with people. What about if you're in a relationship that you've been in for many years? And, um, you know, Maybe it's not working. Maybe there's something missing. Maybe it needs some adjustment. Maybe it needs something that uh, 
you know, it needs something. It just needs something. Well, that's what I do as a coach. And so I haven't said it. You know, I think we're on episode number 35 here of the Coffee and Biscotti show. And I rarely, rarely ever bring up, um, you know, the fact that uh, I'm, a, I'm a clarity coach and, and this is the business that I have. And of course, on top of that, what I do is I also work on my, my Muay Thai. Um, ah, okay. Thank you, Josh, for that. I hope that that works. I, I kind of told him not to use uh, that, but that's okay. See, we knew and hopefully we're going to get it solved. Anyway, back to back to what we're, we're talking about here. So I just want you to know that wherever you are in your life, it's where you need to be. And I just watched the, the, the acceptance speech for George St. Pierre into the UFC Hall of Fame this morning. And listen, my friends, if you want to be great at what you do, everybody needs a coach. That's just the way it is. If you want to be better at something, you need a coach. Sometimes it's for accountability. Sometimes it's for asking the right questions. See, because in the reality therapy process, which is Dr. Glasser's work, we talk about that there's four parts to it. There's getting, getting your, your patient or client to figure out what it is that they want. So get what it is that they, what they want. Then it's about the total behavior. And total behavior is made up of four components. Acting, thinking, feeling, and physiology. The third part is this, what I think is a, a most, the most important is the self-evaluation. Because if I, as a coach, can ask you the right questions, then what happens is, is you start to self-evaluate up here. And then finally is the plan. And having a plan to move you closer to what it is that you desire most. And, you know, with today's guest, I mean, listen, guys, I joked about this. I joked about this with a friend of mine the other day. But I said, most people have trouble dedicating themselves to watch a, a, a minute video on YouTube or a minute video on social media. What is it like to dedicate 30 plus years to a craft, to a profession? That's what we're going to talk about with today. That's who we're going to talk to today in Calvin Lawrence is we're going to talk about, you know, all the, all the stuff that he's been through. So once we get this stuff sorted out, we'll be back. If you're in the chat, please let us know you're here. Uh, I always want to give a shout out to all my loyal, uh, uh, loyal twitchy verse friends. Shout out to Sandra Mio and Rum Cake Queen, 416 Raf, Two Tums in Jamaica, Just Rob Official, and of course, my dear friend Josh Putin Nation for always being here. And even now, as we're chatting here today, guys, I've got Josh working behind the scenes, trying to help poor Calvin figure out how the heck to get back on. We actually did this, believe it or not, my friends, a couple of days ago. We did a sort of a, a, a light and sound check, but uh, I don't know, something may have happened. So we are, we are working on it. And I know that slowly, but surely we'll, we'll get it figured out. My friend, Josh, the genius is on the case. Um, so that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell, my friends. I mean, I, I, like I said, I never talk about the chorus life and never talk about coaching. But I'll tell you, since I'm here and we've got a few minutes, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking a little bit even about Muay Thai and talking about the journey of, of because I put a post the other day about this, that, you know, we're talking about these people in transition. Well, most people, when they're going through something, the first place, the first place to start is to move the body. And that's why I love what Muay Thai has done for myself 
and done for the thousands who have walked through the doors of, of my, my old MMA school. If we move the body and we start to train the body, what happens is, is, is that there's a physical effect. You'll start your, see your body start changing. You may lose some weight. You may gain some muscle. But what they don't talk about is the physiological changes that happen. And the physiological changes are a little bit more subtle. But they're there. There's something that happens to you as you start to move your body and get your body in shape. Now, the beauty, of course, about Muay Thai, and I don't know if you can see that poster in the back, guys, is that there's a, there's a strong cultural component to it, a sp strong spiritual component to it. Thailand is 95% Buddhist. So Muay Thai is, 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 you know, deeply rooted in its culture. And Buddhism, of course, is a large part of that culture. So, again, you start moving your body, you start being physical in your body, and what ends up happening is, is that you really start to make some serious changes in your life. And one of the things I said was the beauty about community. So let me put this offer to all those now that are watching and those that are watching after the live stream. Every Tuesday morning, and Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to be running a free Zoom Muay Thai workout for anybody who will write me a message on my Facebook at Crew Mel, uh, at, at, uh, Crew Mel Bellissimo or Mel Bellissimo, which is the business page, um, at Crew Mel Bellissimo on Instagram, Mel Bellissimo on LinkedIn. Even if you're here on Twitch, at Clarity Coach Mel, twitch.tv, Clarity Coach Mel. Um, you, can, you can send me a note that basically states why is it that you would want to join a community like the Wolfpack? Now, the Wolfpack is a, is a, is a bunch of leaders. <laughs> Truthfully, they're amazing humans. And these are people that have seen some success in business. And understand that there's a lot more to, to life than just being successful in business. So the purpose of this is to try now to build this, this community of like-minded people. And so one of the things that I want to do is I want to start bringing in more people into this community so that these people can interact with each other. So I'll tell you something that we're going to do. There's a lovely uh, woman who owns a Thai restaurant here in Ottawa. And this woman is by herself. And she really doesn't have a lot of people here to help. So what we're going to do as the Wolfpack is we're going to be sitting down with this woman and helping this woman who, of course, has had a difficult time because of pandemic running her restaurant. And so we're going to do some community work and help out this wonderful young woman <coughs> excuse me with her uh, with her restaurant so the the muay thai workout is tuesday and thursday at 6 a.m and we're hoping that uh that you can make it i have not seen uh, calvin jump on putin nation how we doing my friend because now i don't have him on the phone or the stream something's going on my friends Good old technology. Poor guy. He's a, he's a retired police officer. I don't know that he's uh, very technologically sound. I mean, let's be fair. I'm not very technologically sound, and I got, and he's got a few years on me. But um, anyway, continuing, continuing along, since, since we have the time, you should join me. You should join me uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 6 a.m., for a, a Zoom Muay Thai workout, uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes is a good, strong workout. The rest of the time, we are doing some sort of a, sort of a technique portion. And then uh, I close with sort of a, a reflection, meditation, gratitude session. 
So I hope you'll join us. And again, what I'd like for you to do is just to send me a message as to why, what, what, what you would get from joining this group, uh, what it is that you would like to receive from, from joining this group. And, and I think that that's, that's super, super important. I think I'll, I'll read the question in the same way that I posed it in my post. Once I get to it, my friends, once I get to it. So, yeah. Um, did I have it? No, I think it's in the video itself. But... Um, yeah, all it was is that there's a video uh, with the interest of joining the Wolf Pack. Uh, and that's it for, for now, my friends. We're going to wait patiently. But uh, like I said, if you're in the chat, uh, please uh, say hello. I'm going to uh, pause for a moment and to see if we can get poor Calvin up online. I'm sure he's freaking out right now, trying to going, oh my God, I'm supposed to be on a live show. And uh, he's uh, he's not here. Okay, let's see if I can resend this link to my friend. Josh, any thoughts, buddy? If you guys can still see me, I'm just resending the link for him to join. Oh, what do we got? Hey, I think we got him. Calvin, I can see you, but now I can't hear you. Hey, oh, can yeah, he hear is. There it is. Hey, okay, hey. we're on. We're on. Thank you, sir. Look at that, my friends. The uh, main... I just have to set up here. Um, get the legend. Two seconds. I'd rather fight Muhammad Ali than do this stuff. But uh, with computers, <laughs> but what are you gonna do? Ah, what are you gonna do? Don't worry, coach. It's all good, man. This is okay. the beauty Hold about uh, hey, hey, Putin Nation. You're a genius, buddy. No, I'm not. Your buddies are, and you're a patient man. I apologize. Please don't but, even uh, think twice about it. Better late than never. So, yeah, I'm right now, yeah, move over a little bit more, Calvin. We want to see that handsome face. Uh, the other way. The there other way. There, there you go. We did it. Woo. All right. Now, let me plug in my uh, your earbuds. My connection here. Okay. Very well. Very well. Yeah. San Mio in the house. Yeah. Hello, beautiful goddess. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Charm. Welcome to the show. You'll be punching me out. Charm, you'll be punching You'll be punching me. How come all you guys are, you know, I love this stuff and then bang, right? Okay. okay. How you been? Hey, Calvin. Ladies and gentlemen, the man, Jeez. the myth, the legend, Calvin Lawrence. You did it, brother. See? It's all good, baby. It's all oh, good. Oh, yeah. There. There's your there's your little bit of stress for the morning, coach. <laughs> Coffee pills. <laughs> I love it. Listen, I need some volume now. All right. I need some volume. Coach, you know. I want to say that the reason why I started off this program, I mean, this is our, I think, 35th or 36th show, believe it or not. Wow. And one of the things that, and, and one of the reasons I started this show, Coach, was to basically share people's stories of passions and transformations. And the reason why this is so important to me and, and, and so powerful for me and, and really resonates is because... I just think that the world has enough shit in it that we need to pump out some good media, some positive stories, because let's face it. Maybe somewhere in, in, in some part of the world, there's not a guy that, you know, there's a guy that doesn't know who Calvin Lawrence is, but they're going to hear his story. And they're going to hear the story of the trials and tribulations that you went through. And maybe this guy's having a really shitty day coach. And he sees you, he listens to your story and he says, you know, I thought I was, you know, having a pity party for myself. I really thought my life was going bad. But you know what? I'm motivated by what Calvin Lawrence has to share with us. I'm motivated by, uh, you know, his story. And, and that was the purpose of doing this. And Calvin, I mean, let's face it, my friend. 
you're uh, you're you really are a, a, an amazing human being. Uh, you you've done so much. I was you know as you were trying to log on, I was sort of reading some of your credentials from the CV that you sent me. But I mean the list just the list just goes on and on and on, you know. But coach, what I like to do first always is I like to start with you. Paint us a picture. Tell us about Calvin Lawrence. Where was he born? How many how many siblings does he have? Take us through the beginning and then your journey as to becoming. Uh, a police officer. Well, first of all, I'm just with all that, that you're reading. I'm just Calvin Lawrence from Goddard Street in Halifax, and Creighton Street, Main Street, and Bel Air Terrace. That's all I am, right? You know, that's where I. Where, 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 that's in my head. All right. Um, I, I always uh, met Myro Angelo. I think that's her name. Uh, she always had this saying: "She said when people praise you, don't pick it up and don't put it down." And when people uh, put you down, don't pick it up, don't put it down. So that that way you remain, uh, you don't get swell headed and you don't beat up on yourself. You're just mm -hmm. there. And then it's up for other people to, to say, right? right. So I, I was born in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And as I point out in my book, uh, I was adopted by my uncle who became my father in Halifax. So I was raised uh, as an only child in a mixed marriage. Um, my mother and father in Yarmouth were both, were both uh, black. Uh, so I had a very different experience. Um, my, I, have, I, have, I had four sisters and, and, and two brothers, and some have passed away, unfortunately. But I wasn't raised with them, but I got to know them uh, through going to visit Yarmouth and then as I grew up and some lived in Toronto and Halifax so uh, I got to know my siblings and it wasn't a secret it wasn't a secret that I was adopted uh, but then again you have to ask you know you you have issues that that we we deal with and and uh, like most of us there's family pathology and there's uh, and then there's uh, dysfunction to a degree um, so we all have to go through that and we all have to, uh, in some way come to terms with it. And, uh, the only problem with coming to terms with it is that you don't know, you have to come to terms with it until you find out that you're not the only one that's going through all of this, uh, uh, these issues on the planet. Like you say, uh, some people have down days and, and to say that you have a down day and you're the only one on the planet that has a down day, uh, People think that a lot of people think that, uh, and it's very uh, it's very hard to seek assistance. Um, I've learned about it probably in '95 uh, that I'm not the only one going through a lot of trials and tribulations. Uh, this is minus racist behavior. Uh, so uh, as I start reading and I start talking to people, and you go for counseling and you. Uh, and you start figuring out just like who you are and why you're the way you are. And uh, it's called schema, your schema. So uh, that's kind of how uh, I came up. I came up in Halifax. Uh, I came up, went to Joseph, ha Joseph House School and I went to Queen Elizabeth. And uh, um, there was always the racial component, although I wasn't aware of it. Uh, for a long time i wasn't aware of it i knew it, but I, I i i sort of looked at it as a uh, individual uh thing where um basically what it is is a global system um explaining that it's another hour or so but uh i look at it a little bit differently and um so going through your family of origin issues um uh, some trauma and dictates to some degree how you react to racist behavior. And of course, I became a police officer in 1969. Uh, uh, and uh, I police my own community, which is both a blessing and a curse. But um, I can still go home and, and, and walk up and down the street and, and not feel that I'm not welcomed by some people some people of course will never welcome me but uh that's the way it is that's that's the way it is uh, 
if you uh, if you don't make some enemies in this world, um, not just talking about my community, but if you don't make some enemies in this world, then you have a suit for nothing. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so coach, you, you, you go through this time in 1969, you become a police officer. You have to, I have to ask you though. And I've been wanting to ask you this for such a long time. Like, is this something you really wanted to do? Like was like when you were young, did you say, man, when I grew up, I want to be a police officer. Was that the dream? No. Um, I was sort of floating around. I wasn't really paying attention. I mean, I failed two grades, grade six, grade eight. Uh, and then I started to, to kind of kick into to being accomplished. I wanted to accomplish something. And I don't know why that's for psychologists or psychiatrists, but I, I kind of flipped it. And uh, so uh, I was in grade, uh, I was in grade 12. And uh, I was thinking of joining the Navy, actually, because I looked at my family history and there's a lot of uh, people who... Uh, who were involved in, in, in armed forces. I mean, my father, my, my birth father went to war, got wounded, came home. Um, and then I looked at my, my roots and there were some people involved in, in some of the military. So I was kind of, I, I like that structure. And uh, as I said in my book, we're just hanging out on the corner. That was what we do when you're, when you're black, you hang out on the corners. That was our email. That was where we got our emails. You know, what's happening? What's going on? You know, what's up? That's it. Right? That's it. So, That's you, the so email. you meet on the corner and everybody starts to to uh, put out the news, right? Nowadays, you get your cameras and everything, but uh, uh, you put out the news. So uh, uh, there was this gentleman that was going to, uh, uh, they were going to a meeting with the chief of police, Burden Mitchell. And I think, I kind of think it was just a, hey, there's Ricky and Calvin standing on the corner picking up our emails. So uh, anyway, uh, Parker Borden, uh, Buddy Day, and Donnie Young, all from the community, each having their story. And um, it was like a, a scene out of The Sopranos, get in, you know, get in, the car pulls up, right? Where are we going? Just never mind, get in, right? So, you know, so anyway, we got in and we went to the meeting at the police station and we got summer jobs after they had their meeting. Uh, Buddy Day said, maybe you can have you get a summer job. So that planted the seed right there. I said, it's, it's not military, has a degree of prestige, and there's no layoffs or strikes. It's probably the only thing I ever did in my life that I thought about that was positive in some ways is that I didn't want a job where there were strikes and layoffs. So I went back to school uh, because I was only 19, but I worked in the detective office uh, filing stuff. We just had summer jobs, and Ricky went to the traffic office. So um that kind of planned to see us like this is what i'm going to do i like this this is what i'm going to do but i i took some heat because i had a whole year to go back to school of course this was the time of the panthers and the the black coming of age in halifax so i took a lot of verbal abuse and uh, you know now all these people that gave me the verbal abuse they became police officers or their sons became police officers <laughs> <laughs> after they, after they oh, kicked I... me to the curb right so I always right. tease them when I go home. I tease these guys, right? And then it's the same. I, I mean, I was bullied. I was bullied uh, as, as a kid. So I go to the gym and learn boxing. And I come up and say, okay, let's go. And they said, we don't do that no more. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that no more. I said, okay. Well, okay, yeah. But anyway, that's kind of my, my, my story. Um, naturally, uh, looking back, you say, well, um, why were they hiring black police officers at the rate they were doing when they never did before? I mean, I, 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 right. I give us example in my book uh, where somebody would come in that's black and they fill out an application form. And, and when it, when they leave, they all laugh and crumple it up and throw it in the basket in the waste paper basket. So of course they were, what, what they were doing was they were hiring black police officers to appease uh, black people. Um, uh, uh, in relation to the Panthers coming and the and the and the racial strife, also there were a lot of people don't know this, and especially the Black Lives Matter people because they're young. A lot of black people were were saying we want black cops. Now that's another debate uh, story, or or do you want black cops to do the job properly and be treated with dignity and respect, or do you want black cops just to say, well, you know, turn a blind eye and let you go? 
So that's another topic that that could be open for discussion. But uh, basically, they were hiring black police officers. Um, they hired Leighton Johnson in 1967. He was the first. He was from East Preston, Nova Scotia. And then they hired uh, uh, John Morrison. Uh, they hired Ricky Smith, myself, Max Hartley. So all of these people were hired within a two or three year period. Wow. Whereas before, you never saw a black police officer. And so you're not thinking of this when you get hired, you're thinking of it as an opportunity to, to do a job and, 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 to, and to follow a career. This is it. This is like a bottle of Pepsi. You open it up and it's full of energy and you're ready to go. But as time went on, um, it takes you about five or six years when you now become eligible for certain positions or promotions that wasn't open to black people. So the question, the Panthers had, had left, so the question now becomes the same question when when uh, Abraham Lincoln emancipated the slaves. Well, slavery's over. What are we going to do with the black people now? Mm, right. So yeah, you were there. You were working. Uh, so I I read this, and uh, you're always questioned whether you're reading this if it's right. But uh, the first black police officer was hired in 1960. Seven and the first promotion, one promotion in the history of Halifax City police officer of a black person was Max Hartley in 1995. So you do the math. Smokes. 1995. That long from 67 yeah. to 95. There were no black people promoted. Now, when you when you dig down into that, you can look at positions, opportunities, courses. Um, that's, that's some, another topic that you talk on, right? Yeah. So, so I left, I, I realized this, or at least I thought I realized this and now I know it was true. So I left in 1978 for the RCMP and, um, because of, there was a, a, a large, uh, coverage of me not being able to, uh, allowed to go to the Olympics. And that's a story too, because um, I don't, I didn't expect people to give me time off to go the, to train to go to the Olympics. But we could have mediated something. But it was we don't even want you boxing. So, well, is it against the rules? No. Um, is the city getting uh, positive feedback? Is the country getting positive feedback? Yes. Is the community giving positive feedback? Yes. So, so the discussion became, well, you know, gee whiz, it'd be nice if you got promoted, you'd be the first black person, blah, blah, what would that do for the black community? Uh, oh, well, it'd be nice if he goes to the Olympics. What would that do? It'd be good for, 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 for whatever, be the first black for this and black for that. Maybe I just want to do something as Calvin Lawrence. Maybe, I, I, you know, you're, you're, a, you're meaning the people in power are signing this right. uh, label. And then it became very political. Uh, where people were trying to uh, walk up the ladder uh, on my back based on getting me to the Olympics. Okay, but sorry, so, Coach. I got I got a yeah. time on here because this is huge. Like this is like, you know, this is like almost like a a Muhammad Ali story of of you know stopping to go to to Vietnam and then pulling the pulling the the, the heavyweight championship away from him, right? And of course, many of yeah. course know that. But in your case, Coach, you went. In 1975, the Canadian Nationals were held in Gatineau, Quebec, were they not? No, Montreal. Or in Montreal. Montreal. Yeah. So you were uh, in Montreal. Yeah. Okay. The so you went could... there. Yeah. And you won the title. Yes. And of course, the side story is, is that Ricky Atkinson was supposed to be your opponent. <laughs> Ricky's, Ricky's still looking for me. I'm, I'm ducking him. I'm ducking him, man. <laughs> I'm ducking him, man. But really, so you won. You won the 1975 Nationals. And in 1976, the Olympics were where? Uh, in Montreal. Oh, they were in Canada at that time. That's right. They were in Montreal. Okay. And and the thing is, they did not send a heavyweight rep to represent Canada. In the, in the 1976 Olympics, they did not send a heavyweight boxer to represent Canada. Who was the alternate other than you? There was no alternate. There was no, there's because, nobody. You see, because the 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 person that I had beat, um, 
uh, was beat me um, in the winter games a year earlier. Okay, beat me in the winter games. He knocked my filling out of my tooth, actually. So, so you know, I had a little bit of. I gotta get back in here and uh, you know get some get some payback. You know, gotta get some. But anyway, I, I beat him on a decision. Yeah, and 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 uh, so he could have went, I guess, but uh, I don't know why he didn't. But there was no alternate, and uh, people rallied for me to go. But you have to understand, I never became, I never entered boxing to to be to go to the Olympics. I just, I was a sparring partner. I was a sparring partner for everyone that boxed, right? So um, it was only later in life that I started that I uh, Taylor Gordon came to Halifax, Taylor Gordon Senior, and he uh, he organized amateur boxing. So I just get it on the tail end of that. But because I was standing in a corner and, and all these boxers were getting instructions from their coaches and I was just standing there, I had to kind of like make my own style and my own way. So when all these guys came from the national teams and they're right, I could hold my own with them. Cause when the, from the boys from the hood got through with you, you know, this was kind of like a breeze. <laughs> You know, okay, when all those guys. So coach, wait a minute. You're telling yeah, me that you, you know, actually didn't even have a formal coach? Not, no, uh, not until uh, 19. I didn't box, first of all, but I sparred. But I never had a coach until probably 73. Well, whenever Taylor showed up in Halifax, you know, Taylor Gordon. That was in the 70s, uh, 73, oh, 74. So, so, so you're a natural you know, athlete. Well, I, I learned through mistakes and I, and I learned through my father through errors <laughs> yeah I learned through errors right so so uh, I never had basically so so people would tell you I mean you're doing this wrong you're doing that wrong try to do this try to do that but I never had a person that that took because I wasn't the coach I had was my policing I was I was in policing but at the end of the day I would go to the gym and uh, and I and then and, and David David Downey who, who was a Canadian champion uh, he would, he would, uh, as I, I mentioned in my book, he would take me, uh, he would take me all over the place and I would, I would spar with him. And of course, you know, he was way ahead of me, but I was learning. And then Kevin, his, Kevin came along and I was, I was beat up by a lot of downies, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> so we sparred, inspired, inspired. And, uh, Sherry Lawrence, uh, uh, another boxer who, who was from Yarmouth, uh, no relation. He, he, he used to, uh, invite me over for a meal and we'd start sparring. He was uh, a well-ranked uh, fighter, you know, so it's a hard way to get a meal, you know, just, you know. Yeah, I'd say so. Well, got to be yeah, easier so, ways to get a meal. That's right. You know, they hold three fingers up and they say, how many? I said, it's Friday. <laughs> oh my God. So, Coach, so, you know, that, that was kind of my boxing thing and I did it. You know, a little bit, maybe because my father used to train, train, work out. I mean, he never, he never got into boxing, but you know what? You want to please your father. And then I wanted to stop the bullying. And then I, I wanted to deal with the stress of, of being a police officer. Uh, so all of those things got me to the gym. Some people will read a book. Some people will go running. I went to the gym and I hit somebody, right? Because I was so stressed out. But then they're stressed out too. So they're hitting me back. So I still hit the bag. I still, you know, I go down and I do the bag and I'm going to the gym tonight, you know? So, I mean, uh, uh, that was my kind of my boxing, boxing, uh, uh, process, but it was the policing that I had for my, my, my career and my job. And, and I never wanted to leave Halifax, but to get to any kind of a position. Hey, did we lose him? And where it wasn't put go, and and because of the there. publicity uh, of my boxing, and the, and the chief had me to go home and hide. Um, they really didn't want me in the RCMP when I look back at it now. And and uh, but you know it, I did go, and uh, what I found is that the system, the holes in the net, are are a bit bigger uh, for some opportunities. But the process is the same. And they will not allow another culture to become dominant. And this is what you're seeing today. No dominant culture, that's European culture, is ever going to allow another culture uh, or race to become dominant. 
And you're seeing that in the US, you're seeing it in Canada, and you saw it for the last, for, 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 for the time that I've been on earth. And, and uh, once you catch on to the game, um, then you're basically ignored. You know, just ignored by by mainstream. Um, they've had this. They've had these, these uh, discussions or not. Uh, there's systemic discrimination in the RCMP. So I always say, well, or in policing, I always say, well, how many cases over what period of time does it become systemic? That's what we got to de determine first. But if you're if you're saying this systemic and you're using old terms, I got the proof that it is. I got the proof, but they're not going to have me on, on, on CBC and they're not going to have me in Parliament talking to these committees because they know that I can prove it and I got the proof right here, sitting right beside me. But I challenge people. But on the other hand, I believe in policing. So I challenge organizations like Black Lives Matter. Set the cameras up, get the TV programs, and let's talk about defunding the police, abolishing the police. Uh, 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 or, or uh, what's the other one that they, they call for? There's another uh, area they call for. Uh, defunding the police, ab abolish the police, you know. So set the cameras up and let's have the debate. But they're not going to have the debate. You see, because I'm giving them a perception of what I have done in my knowledge. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying I'm going to challenge you. And, you, and, I, and I encourage you to challenge me on systemic racism in policing and on philosophy, some philosophies of Black Lives Matter. Because Black Lives Matter is a logical response to an illogical world from a racial perspective, in my opinion. Right, right. Wow. So, Coach, I mean, th this is the perfect segue. So, you 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 become in nineteen was it nineteen seventy six? You become an RCMP officer, or you leave, or is it nineteen seventy eight that you leave uh, Nova Scotia? Seventy eight. I left. I left. So seventy eight. And where did you go to after that? Where where did where my did first, they? My first posting was Newfoundland. Okay. But uh, but but what people don't see is that when I had my interview, the first question was for the RCMP. So, what happened with your boxing? What's your story there? That's the first question. So obviously it concerned them. The second thing that people don't see is that in writing, it was uh, it was said basically, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of ad-libbing here, that, uh, that I had worked in, in the area of police race relations and I created a positive setting. You know, it wasn't just me, but I, I created a positive setting. Well, if I created a positive setting, and I was looked upon as someone who would be valued in relation to police race relations in Nova Scotia, where there's a lot of conflict. Why am I going to Newfoundland? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so, I mean, I mean, this is where, this is where you look at the refinement stage. You see racist behaviors established, maintained, advanced, and refined. The refinement stage goes on every day. There's, ch there's changes every day, refinement. Uh, the, all these new terms they come up with is, is refinement. This is a refinement stage, you know, where they come up with these, uh, with these terms, anti-black racism and, uh, and, and that type of thing. So um, I went to Newfoundland. So, okay, that's fine. Uh, I was the only black person in, in Newfoundland, you know, this is a blueberry in a bottle of milk. So the only black cop there, you know, so that's fine. Uh, so I did my job. And, I, and I'm not I'm not sorry I went because I, I learned about rural policing. It's federal. So rural policing is a different type of policing. So that gave me another rung in a ladder of experience. So I, I learned about rural policing. So um, once I left Newfoundland, I left Newfoundland and I went to Toronto and I, I, I worked at drug sections and you, that, this is another... Uh, a uh, stereo stereotype uh, situation where where all or most black members of the RCMP are either encouraged encouraged to go into undercover work or drug sections. This is a part of the systemic process. They never encourage you to become a liaison officer in Thailand 
or 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 uh, or commercial crime or or it's drugs or undercover drugs. So this is a systemic process. Uh, so I went there, uh, Toronto, and uh, my story is is played out there. Uh, and this is where in Toronto where I got into protective policing. Because you're looking, I, I always wanted to specialize, and I thought it would be drugs, but it was too it was too crazy. People were too crazy to work there all the time. So uh, I went to uh, uh, VIP security in Toronto, and this is where I started to hone my skills, and I became a uh, a trainer, uh, a national trainer at that time. Uh, and then I came to Ottawa to the Prime Minister's security, and I became, uh, I was still training, I became an international trainer. I've guarded uh, presidents, I've uh, got letters from the United States Secret Service, certificates of appreciation. Um, and then wham, 10 years of hard work, because one person wanted to hold me back. So that's where my first settlement came. Uh, in relation to the RCMP, but remember, you win, you win, but they hold the grudge. So the vagina to get away from all this uh, this trauma, uh, this trauma and and uh, conflict. And I taught for five years, and this is where I got into. Uh, I was in applied police sciences, but this is where I got into police defensive tactics. And like I say, this was this was great because finally my boxing paid off. I could, you know, I could use this for my. They needed a person to teach to teach boxing, so I did it every day. Um, I but I also taught other things. But I had some of it. I had to go by the book because I had no. I had no past experience. Like I said, the other guys there was Muay Thai guys. There was uh, grapplers. There was guys and. Guys would, you know, I was a drummer, you know, they choke you and they tap, 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 you know. But but I liked all that, you know. What just, an expression. I, I was what tapping on the floor, tapping on the leg, tapping on the ceiling. I mean, I was tapping everywhere, right? But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the roughness of it, right? And uh, there's nothing like, you know, getting a towel before the next class and wiping up your own blood. You know, it's just great, you know. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, so... so uh, that's where that came from. And then, of course, uh, I got into coming back to 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 Ottawa and uh, and they didn't want me back. But something you see, something I always done is is I was a savior of saver of documents. I just saved everything. I saved emails. I, in fact, I should have saved another 20, 25 percent more than I did save because with my moves, different places. I got rid of some stuff. I should have saved everything. Coach. Oh, I hope we didn't lose him. He was on a roll. Putin Nation. Yeah, give it a sec. Yeah, it has something to do with his internet. Let's see if he comes back. Anyways, you see, I didn't know that. I think it's a Wi-Fi blip. Uh, he's a, he's gone, so we'll have to get him back on. But see, I didn't know that, guys. I didn't know that he was uh, that he actually did personal security and uh, and he actually worked for uh, the prime minister here uh, and for presidents uh, from all over the world that uh, I guess came to visit here in Canada. Um. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, I know there's a few of you out there. Joe, uh, Joe, twenty-seven. Hope be the cure. Sending you much love. Hope you're feeling. Hope you're feeling better today, brother. Sending you a little healing energy your way. Uh, let's see if we can uh, get Calvin back on. But what a story, man! What an absolute incredible story so far. Um, and what we're going to do now, guys, is we're going to actually dive in a little bit more into the book because I want to know. I, I want to know uh, a lot more of of this story because again, the the story is about is about racism in the police force, and of course, he's talking about um, you know saving all these documents. This is where he was at; that he was saving all these documents, and that's what he did really well. Uh, I'm just putting up the link so you can see. 
you can find Calvin's book, Black Cop, 36 years in police work and my career ending experience with official racism. You can find it at that link at amazon.ca, Black Cop Police. So go and check that out. Thank you, Josh, for, uh, let me leave it up so you guys can see it. Josh, I don't know if you want to give him a call and uh, see if he's having trouble again. Maybe we can we can get him back on here. Ah, right on, Joe. Good to see that you're feeling well, buddy. Okay, you just texted him. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, last week's guest this year, uh, Joe Capone, uh, with his uh, with his uh, charitable uh, there he is charitable group called uh, Hope Be the Cure. Let's see if Calvin Lawrence is with us. Hey, Calvin, are you there with us? Can you hear me? There we go. You're back. So I'm sorry, uh, my, 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 my computer's good. It's got plenty of juice. I don't know why it shut down. I think it was a Wi-Fi thing. But anyway, here's where we were. We were talking about you saving all these documents. Coach, talk us through that. Like, what were these documents for? You were saving everything because it represented some proof of something? Well, I always, I, I have an immaculate record, but there were situations where some people didn't want me to have an immaculate record. For example, every year you're supposed to have an annual assessment done, uh, written assessment of your work. So I would, I, I still have uh, 28 with the RCMP and I, I have through access to information, I have a few assessments uh, from Halifax City Police because you weren't allowed to see them then. Back then, you couldn't see them. Now you, you can see them. So I have all my, my 28, but you see some people uh, uh, were what I call racial tailoring. And racial tailoring is minimizing your, 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 your accomplishments and restricting your opportunities. This is racial tailoring. So some people would rather not say that I did something well. But there is a space where I can say I did something well, and I, I put it down. So a lot of times my assessment had more to do with uh, my accomplishments than they were willing to write. And that's fine. I wrote them. Um, so I, I just developed a habit of, of saving certain things. Um, and when I was in uh, depot, I always used the philosophies of boxing uh to solve my problems and uh the philosophies there's not too there's a lot more to it than hitting somebody and you, as you know as as a great and you're a great coach so i'm putting that out there right so um what i did is i sent a bunch of uh emails and like you would a jab I, some of them were were very uh straight some of them were a little limp some of them were conciliatory some of them were accusatory and then i waited and i slapped in an access to information request for the emails where my name was mentioned and uh that's where i caught them with the right hand on the chin flat-footed because the real deal came out and the real deal is in my book with names and with uh their emails and what they said and um this is where people they have uh i guess you would call it cognitive dissonance where they won't believe what they're reading they refuse to believe what they're reading so you take the core values of the royal canadian model police and the mission visions and values as it applies to their their uh their uh duties and you compare them and of course there's no comparison because it's, it's, it's a, it's a legacy of deceit and deception. You see, there's, there's white behavior and there's white supremacist behavior. And the difference is deception. There's your two week course on, 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 on race relations. There, there's your two week course, remove deception. You remove white supremacist behavior. And
Coach, did we lose you? Oh, man, I hope we didn't lose him again. Too bad he was getting to the good stuff. Uh, Joe, thanks for asking the question. Uh, I don't <laughs> – that's a tough question, Joe. Joe asks, uh, you know, uh, what, what needs to be done to stop systemic racism. <laughs> It's a good question. I don't have enough experience with it to 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 give an answer, Joe. I, I really don't know, you know. Calvin, you there? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I'm here. Barely, but you're here. You're back. You're back. All right. Um, so uh, as I was saying, that I saved a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, I was able to write the book and also uh, receive two settlements. One, one was in Ottawa and one was uh, in Regina. Okay, now, Coach, I want to go into that. So you're in, you go through these things, you do personal or VIP, what did you call it, VIP protection? Protective policing. Protective policing. Uh, is there is there somebody like uh, that would have been real famous that you were? Uh... Well, there was, uh, it was Bill Clinton, President Clinton. Wow. Um, there was, I was in charge of the bodyguard team. Uh, this is where, the, you see, this is one of the, what they do, I was a constable. Uh, lowest rank, but I was in charge because I had the knowledge, but they didn't want to give me the the rank that the goes with it. Right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there was uh, um, King of Tonga, for example, who came from Tonga. We, we worked, but you were the bodyguard or site security or whatever. I was in charge of the bodyguard team in in uh, for the for the prime minister in a couple of summits. Um, in Toronto. So, I mean, there were things like that, that I was given a lot of responsibility. Uh, but uh, the opportunities to move upward never, never materialized. Okay. So, so to hold it there, coach, because I, I want to kind of paint this picture. So you do VIP protection, you go to Regina, you come back to, or you're in Ottawa, you go to Regina, you come back to Ottawa. When does this, this motivation to write the book, because that's a lot of effort. I, I can't even imagine what it took. And, and, and more importantly, you know, I mean, because, of course, I've spoken to Ricky on this, on this behalf because of his book called The Life Crimes and Hard Times of Ricky Atkinson. But, you know, one of the things he said that was the most difficult part, and, and, I, and I sort of want your perspective, of it, is, is that he said to me, one of the most difficult part about writing the book is reliving those emotions that you go through. Coach, can you hear me with that? I hope I didn't yes. lose him. You with me, Coach? No, I'm here. So, so yep. Coach Ricky's Coach Ricky talks about the difficulty in writing the book. Um, his book was having to relive the emotions of, of what had happened. So, for you, Coach, what was the inspiration? Right? Yeah, there you go. What What was the inspiration for you to write the book? Well. I, I think I wanted to get the story out. Um, I believe in social justice. Um, that's and I got to give credit to to uh, Miles Howell, who, who assisted me with the book, because when you write a book like that, you 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 can't just go and say this happened and then it happened and that happened. You have to you have to kind of contextualize it. So so I give him a lot of credit for 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 that because it wouldn't have been done probably if if I hadn't had a good person to help me write it, because you you suffer trauma. Uh, when you're put in these positions, you just don't go, oh, I'll launch a lawsuit. There's the time, there's the money, there's the stress, there's, there's, there's the, uh, the people that are coming at you. I think you're right, Josh. It's not the powers that be trying to uh, mess with his Wi-Fi. <laughs> Yeah, you never know, eh, bro? You never know. Coach, you with us? You never know because okay. there we go. Uh, there's enough, to, you know, when you file complaints, people come at you in all different ways. And you have to go back into that environment. And you don't know who's uh, who's after you and who isn't. And, and the reason I say that, I was going to say it the other day uh, or, or just a minute ago, is all my life I've been supervised by white males. Um, I think there was about one white female and uh, one East Indian and one black person that was my supervisor, but their supervisors were white males. So 
Obviously, all white males do not practice white supremacist behavior, but all white males are a beneficiary of that. The same way I or we as males are beneficiaries of dominance in some areas over females. We don't have to be anti-female to have, to have a better advantage over a female. We can fight against that, but we still, when we walk down the street, we are dominant to some degree in some areas of people activity, nine areas of people activity that we work through on a daily basis, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So we, we are dominant in that way. Well, it's the same way with, with white males. Some white males practice white supremacist behavior, some don't. But we have to decide very quickly which, who does and who does not because it could affect our lives. When we walk in and we're sitting down there and we're talking to somebody and we're trying to make our way through life, we have to decide who's trying to screw us over and who isn't because it is deception. If you walk into any police organization and say, okay, would the white supremacists please stand up here? Nobody's going to stand up. And all a politician says is uh, uh, racism exists. Well, racism does not exist. Racist behavior takes place. You know, we don't catch racism like COVID or it's not on a shelf in a bottle. There has to be a body attached to racist behavior either in speech or in action. Right. So, so this is where, this is where uh, the linguistic camouflage and double speak comes in. And some people, unfortunately, are like those bobbers in the car, you know, their head goes up and down and they just, you know, you're driving and they believe all this stuff, but they don't question it a little bit, a little closer. For example, when you hear there's racial tailoring, which I explained, minimizing your, your, your accomplishments and restricting your opportunities. But then they say, well, the first, the highest and the only black person compared to what or who? The first, the highest, and the only. Who are we comparing that to? And why do we say that? No one ever asked that question. And I'm not saying I have the answer, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that we never asked the question. Whenever we say that, we just we just go go on and 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 and, uh, and go our separate ways, you know. And and so I, I'm I, this is what I, I ask these questions. If you're a conservative in the government, I say, well, what are you conserving? Do you ever ask a conservative what he's conserving? No, can't say that I have. No, not not you personally, but I mean <laughs> the audience. I'm talking to you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah what do you course. what do you? And if you ask that question, you get this blank look on your face. You know, what are you conserving? So, so uh, that's why I don't use the term racism and I don't use the term uh, uh, white supremacy. I use the behavior. Right. And then and the we sp per what's that? I said, we, we spoke a little bit about this. It's what I loved about Dr. Glasser's work when we were talking the other day about how he talked about depression as not somebody, like not a noun or a, a, a person, place or thing, but as an action. So why are you depressing? Because yes. this way, there's an action, and that means that the behavior can change. That's right. And it also means that you're not labeling everybody with the same brush. Correct. When you, first of all, you say, well, this police organization is racist. Well, that's like saying a table is racist. Yeah. You know, it, it's inanimate. You say, well, every, every police officer, which you get, every police officer is corrupt. Well, if you're saying that, that means that when there's a shooting downtown and, and black people are shooting at each other, then all black people shoot at each other. That must be what we do, because if you're saying all, right? Uh, if you're saying, well, I saw a prostitute on the corner the other day, then you then then, then what you're saying is, well, well, okay, if she's a prostitute, all women must be prostitutes. I mean, who goes through life like that? You know, you can see through a keyhole with, 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 with both eyes. You're that narrow-minded, right? So, so you you got to break this stuff down, and and because we all live in the same world. But what it has done for to me is that first of all, it's ruined my health to some degree. 
but I'm being compensated for that. I suffer from depression. I suffer from anxiety. I suffer from PTSD. But as they say in boxing, I'm hurt, but I'm still dangerous. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, so it, 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 it breaks you down and it makes you very uh, hypervigilant like an animal you're 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 uh you're scanning your environment for opportunity and threats you're living your life on the outside like an animal rather than on the inside you can't relax because you never know when the next boat is going to start so you can't you can't relax and trust you have trust issues you know you have trust issues you 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 uh me meaning me us uh you have trust issues when you go through things like this and you say, well, you know, even, even you can't even trust your teeth because it bites your tongue sometimes, you know? So, you know, it's just, it's just, <laughs> it's just the way, you know, uh, it is. So, so that's what, that's the effect. So I'm sitting here. Yeah, I look pretty good and I'm doing all right, but I'm damaged goods because of that. Not only because of life beating you up and getting older, but I'm also damaged goods because of what happened. But the best revenge for that type of thing is to help other people, which I've done over the years. Once so, you help other people, it goes, it, it helps out. So coach, when you write this book, can you give us sort of a brief synopsis of the book? Is it, is, I mean, I know that it's an autobiography, but you know, is there, is there something, is, is there something that you could share with our friends in the audience uh, about it that, you know, I mean, cause I know again, it's, it's your life, but, but you know, is there, I guess that I would ask the question, is there something, is there one part of the book that sticks out that you'd like to share uh, with it? Is it, a, is it a series of stories that has happened? You know, you know what I'm trying to ask? And then talk about what would, what would the message be? Because there was a couple of questions, even in the chat, Coach, that said, you know, how do we stop systemic racism? How, like, how, does, how do we do anything about it? How, how does it stop? Because I love that you talk about it's it's an individual behavior. So then how do we stop these individual behaviors from doing? It? I know there's a lot of questions there. Well, no, no, it's good. It's good. Well, first of all, it, it, it's kind of a, a how, I, how I awoke from being a naive kid to being somebody here today that has an informed opinion on the topics um, I teach, uh, I teach or I lecture on, or I present on police race relations. I present on, uh, I develop courses on escorting of high risk inmates. I develop courses on um, women's safety, situational awareness programs, verbal and mental, not physical. Uh, so I talk about, and I have helped people get through some of these uh, these uh, processes in relation to harassment, bullying, discrimination, and there's no there's no road. This is what you do if this happens. This is what you do as that happens. You adjust, just like in boxing, you adjust to another person's style, mm. and it's no different. As far as my book, um, it, it goes. I think that I went from like a naive person to a person the person I am today and everybody has a story, but I think I, I wanted to write it because it was very uh, settling to me because the defining emotion of the black experience is anger and anger. And, and, and the, the challenge is to go through life and, and be positive without that anger affecting us. That's, that's the, so that's the reason, basically, that I wrote the book. Uh, I think that my most painful amount of um, painful setting in relation to mentioning, mentioning incidents in the book is where I became one of the foremost authorities on protective policing in Canada. And that was simply wiped out by an individual. You know, you, you get to the top, you're ready to fight for the challenge. And somebody says, well, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not going to let you do it. I'm not going to let you do it because I don't like you, you know, no other reason. And because I can't. And that's why, that's why, uh, and, and to talk about that gentleman's uh, or ladies uh, questionable, how do you fight racist behavior? 
You hold individuals accountable for their conscious actions with the information they have at the time. You never hear any police organization say, we are going to hold individuals accountable for racist behavior. Never. Go search your, uh, go search your archives. I've never heard a politician say it. I've never heard a police chief say it. And by the way, chiefs are politicians too. Chiefs and superintendents and commissioners, they're all politicians. They just have the, the, the name police. But you never hear them say that. I'm And do it. And do it. Don't just say it, but do it. So-and-so is being uh, fired. He's not going to get a promotion for five years. He's being reprimanded. He's going to get a verbal reprimand, depending on the seriousness of the offense, because of racist behavior. They don't even use the term racist behavior. They use the term uh, bullying, sexual harassment, and harassment. You very, very seldom hear the term racist behavior. So that's that's the the linguistic camouflage and doublespeak that goes through our society, and that's not challenge. Yeah. Amazing, amazing that, that you're sharing this, Coach. In fact, Josh, we spoke about our society has lost the appetite for nuance. I'm really glad you have this show to actually work through the nuance of some of these issues with great and in, uh, sightful guests like Calvin. Our friend, I got a Jamaican friend, Coach, from uh, who's in, in Kingston, Jamaica. He spot, and he writes, he's spot on about holding individuals accountable. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And also we have to do we we as black people have to do what other cultures do like a lot of times i'll say we get into discussion the first thing i'll say is okay what's your definition of racist behavior uh because maybe we're talking about two different things and then uh i ask does racist behavior take place that's the yes or no you know uh and then i say well if you say no well i guess we got no line of communication here but uh, if you say, yes, it does, well, should it take place? You know, well, how do we fight it? Well, there's only three ways you fight racist behavior. One is physically with your hands. Uh, one, I only had to threaten to do that once to another police officer. Um, the other is to, to uh, speak out about it, which I do and write about it. And the third is to hate it in your heart, hating it in your heart being the least effective. Now, coach, was there was there was there a lot of a lot of um, what's the word I'm looking for? When the book was published, did you get a lot of sort of pushback from from the police force? Well, my first post um, when I put the book out, somebody a retired police officer said, "You're a lying bastard, and you only want to make money." That's before he read the book. I don't know what he thinks now. <laughs> really? So right out, right off the hop, somebody had somebody. Made oh yeah, it oh yeah, yeah. And then of course, you see, they they tell you, they tell you, you're you're, they they say you're a racist. They say uh, you're a malcontent. They say you just want to make money. They say uh, you're a shit disturber. They say all kinds of things. I'm a lying bastard. All right, but they never say it was wrong. They never say I was wrong. Yeah. Wow. Eh? So, so uh, the pushback that I received, and, and here's what I don't understand. Okay. You, everybody in society, these organizations and these people say racism, racist behavior is wrong. So if I go and fight it, if I go and fight the people that are practicing racist behavior, then why am I kicked to the curb? if they say racist behavior is wrong. And the thing is, I, I believe in the individual. I mean, if I'm boxing, I don't fight the referee. What happened? Coach. It's the Wi-Fi. Here we go. Yes. Yeah. There we go. You're, if you're going after me, here we go. You're good, coach. 
Okay, if you're going if you're going after me, um, then the other cheek, Martin Luther King did that and he blew his head off. You know, I'm not I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna fight back, and that's I've done. That's all I've done is fight back, and I talk on it, I write on it, I help other people, black, white, male, female, French, English, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, that's how I get my revenge is by helping other people. I'm still, I'm still the same guy, but I have, I have internal injuries and my thinking is damaged to a degree, but I'm all right. I can take some pills for that and go to the gym. You know. <laughs> hey man, hitting the bag. Some of the best medicine in the world, baby. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, and but anyway, that's coach, the, can I ask you something? So you're you're certainly. still going to the gym, you're still hitting the bag, and and how old are you now? Seventy-two. Oh, you're just a young man, seventy-two <laughs> years old. <laughs> wow. Yeah, right. I'm not old if I was a tree, right? right. I wouldn't be old if that's I was right. a tree, you know. Everything's so. relative. That's right. <laughs> everything's relative, coach. <laughs> coach, so what do you have going on? Like, like, you know, tell us a little bit like What's happening? I mean, now that you're retired, um, I hope he can hear us. It looks like he froze again. Coach, you with us? Josh, I wish we could figure out why the internet's like this. Coach, you with us? Yeah, you're back. I'm so, Coach. Yeah, like what's what's happening in the life and times now? You know, you're a retired police officer. I'm, you know, do you do book tours with it, with 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 the book? Well, if if somebody asks me to to do something, I'll do it. And uh, like yourself, I appreciate you you having me on to express my views. And uh, I do some uh, lectures at universities, and uh, I offer to talk to anybody about police race relations. I did a uh, I did a a course on uh, or presentation on diversity. Uh, management uh, for Corrections Canada about a, two or three months ago. Uh, so if somebody calls me, I, I, I help out or I talk to the community or whatever they want. Um, and other than that, I'm just hanging out and uh, travel a little bit other than so COVID showed up, but uh, I used to travel a little bit and uh, it's just getting old, you know, so. Yeah. Listen, I'm telling you, man, this is what I want to happen. I want a tour with Ricky Atkinson and Calvin Lawrence to do a tour together because well, I, I think I, it's so great. I think it's so great. Talk about both sides of the coin. We 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 have a lot in common. And I realized that when we started talking and we sat down together, he had me on his show. And I think if you put Ricky and myself together and talk to youth, I think that it would complete the circle because I can only do one side of the moon. He does the other. But if you put it together, we, we, we see the same thing. And you too, you know, you, you're there, you got a story. And I think that uh, uh, I'd be interested in hearing your perspective on certain things, you know, because I may be wrong. You may be sitting there saying this guy don't know what he's saying when it comes to this or that. Right. Well, to be honest with you, coach, you know, the, th the truth is, is that I actually think it's quite, it's quite humorous to me on some level because my backyard, where I grew up in my family home, happened to be... Are you still with us? Jesus. Damn internet. Coach, you there? Hey, Joe, he's quite the amazing guy, eh? He's done some stuff, Mr. Calvin Lawrence. I would love to have him and Coach Ricky do something together, man. I'm telling you, they would knock it out of the park. I hope he comes back. I hope he didn't lose him. Anyway, what I was going to say to Coach was is that it's kind of interesting for me to hear all this because my house, when I grew where I grew up in Toronto, my family home, the my backyard basically was the 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 the, the, the Ontario housing park. So I kind of you know I say that I grew up in the hood. I mean, we lost him now. Hopefully he'll come back. But I grew up in the hood, and and you know it's kind of interesting to me because I'm a you know, Italian white boy, but I had a lot of um, black influence in my life because a lot of friends that that were there. In fact, I'm still a, an old school dance hall guy who listens to, you know, the some of the classics. I wish uh, my girl, 
uh, rum cake queen was here, but I know two thumbs in here. We share some, some, some of our passions in music. There he's back. Let's see if we can get him back here, guys. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. He really is. He's such a great, uh, a great human being. Hey, coach, you there? Check that volume, coach, or the speaker. Okay. Can you hear there me now? Yeah, so, coach, what I was saying while you were gone was is that my backyard basically faced the hood in, in, in Toronto, in, in what we used to call jungle. So right. it's interesting to hear this because there was a lot of black influence, particularly Jamaican influence in my life. I'm an old dance hall guy that listens to the classic, you know, the classic reggae dance hall stuff from back in the day, you know? And so it's interesting to hear this perspective yeah. because – Again, I, I guess I'm very blessed in that way that I, I grew up with a lot of uh, a lot of different cultures that were there because they were from all over the world. And of course, where do you think my school was in Toronto? My school was at Western Road in Finch. Oh, right down. <laughs> oh, UN building. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so it's it's yep. interesting yep. to hear, Coach. It's really interesting to hear. So no, I, I do agree. I think that, I think that again, the idea of you and Coach Rick working together is, is a whole great thing. I I really hope that that I could you know in some way help out with this. I just I don't have the connect, but I'd like to be able to to start doing like a tour, uh, and and putting it together because I think it would be great. Um, I think it would be great for the world. And and just like Josh said today. That, that's why the beauty of this platform, Coach, so that we can hear your story. Because to be honest with you, Coach, your story needs to be heard. It needs to be heard all around the world because racism of any kind exists in every country around the world. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, it's kind of funny, but when I was living in Thailand, Coach, the the, the owner of the camp who's, who's now passed, I asked him once of all the police forces in the world, because he had lived everywhere, um, which were the most, you know, which was scary to you. And you know what he said, coach? He said the South African police were the most scariest to him because they were kind of, they were the kind of police force that would shoot first and ask questions later. Yeah. Yeah. And there, well, we've, we've, we've gone a from a, yeah. And, and we've gone from a, you know, it, you know, I have, I wrote an article one time on, on police force versus police service. And when you look at the dress today, and the tattoos and the military garb, the lack or the lack of or people who are unable to get voluntary compliance through verbal intervention, which is what a police officer is supposed to do. They call it a police service. We used to have a police force and uh, the police force was a lot better than the police service of today. Because what I find is that and I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to generalize because you lose accuracy. But for the for the culture, is that uh, police officers no longer wish to uh, uh, resolve issues. They they there's there's more of a confrontational aspect to it. And I my last uh, presentation at Carleton University. I showed what should have been done in relation to the Floyd case and what should have been done in relation to the choking of Garner. Because most people will say it's wrong, and I say it's wrong, but they can't explain why it's wrong. They just say it's wrong. You know, I mean, uh, if you, if you, if you uh, put your tie pads on backwards, I may not know I may not know that they're on backwards or I may not know which way they go, but I certainly know that it's wrong. This doesn't work. Right. So, so Correct. what I was trying to, what I'm trying to explain is that it's like, I'd like to use you, my use of force uh, uh, experience to show people this is the way it's supposed to be done. But you also have to show them why use of force has to be used sometimes. See, there's there's two sides to, to, to this, and uh, I'm the third side of that coin. So, do you you spoke on depth on 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 in depth with regards to the whole situation with with George Floyd was his name? Yes. 
Yeah, the choking uh, incident there. Um, Correct. Yeah. Where they put his yeah. knee on his neck. Yeah, I spoke. Right. I spoke in depth on that. Yeah. 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 So so uh, it's too uh, it's too long now, but I I would do it to any anywhere anytime if somebody wanted it done. I mean, I can I can. now when I say I speak on it, I throw it out there. I throw it out there, and then we have a discussion. We have a discussion, and then we have discussion over use of force. Right. So it doesn't mean that I'm. 100% right and you're wrong. It just means I know what I'm talking about the way you might know what you're talking about. You know, if, if there's certain things that I've done in my life and there's certain things that everybody's done in their life and I'm not going to go in and tell them, well, you're wrong without even knowing what they do and how, why they do it and where they do it. Exactly. No, that's true, coach. Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think with all of it, I, I what I find, coach, is that there's a level of there's a real level of respect with you with understanding why someone does something and sort of getting the information. Uh, one of the, one of the greatest examples coach that I could give you was I remember in my choice theory coach, we're talking about getting information that, that having the information is important. So there's this picture that my mentor puts up and it's the picture of this beat up old piece of shit truck. And it's just this picture. And he says, well, tell me when you look at this picture, how does this truck make you feel? Does it make you feel positive Does it or good? Does it make you feel neutral? Or does it make you feel like this is, you know, like it's, it's a bad feeling? And I said, well, to be fair, it's a piece of shit truck. So it doesn't really make me feel much of anything. It's kind of neutral, but it's also kind of negative because I wouldn't drive the truck. And then he says, what about if I told you that the story behind this truck was that your grandfather used to use this truck in the early part of the 20th century or even the, the late 19th century to basically bring food from the farm to the city that provided money for your, mammy to, for your family to survive. Now, how does that feeling of this old beat up pickup truck look like to you? He says, well, that provides me with a positive experience. He said, that's why there's the important part about getting information. Yes. And also uh, what I find is that because of our, technology which works and doesn't work sometimes um, what we find is that uh, there's no empathy because you you only, the way you get empathy is talking to somebody face to face and there's no empathy and empathy whether it be in policing or any other area absorbs tension empathy absorbs tension so so um, there's a lack of empathy in, in policing today um, and of course in life if you have empathy then then you put yourself in the other person's shoes you don't don't compare it to sympathy it's empathy so so uh, this is and the other of course is is the only difference between a request and a challenge is how you present it and I've, I've seen myself you know asking somebody you know you arrest somebody to say I'm not going to do it blah 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 is there anything I can say or anything you can suggest that would get you to cooperate. I hope to think there is. Now, at the same time, I'm watching this guy because he could do anything, right? But I said that to police officer and one police officer, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> you say that if you were working in a rural area by yourself in a car full of uh, uh, fishermen with hands that look like clubs were in the car and you were going to arrest them, you're by yourself. Because the police officer who says that has never worked alone. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And coach, it's it's kind of funny that you it's kind of funny that you say that because when you talk the about police officer said that. Yeah. When you talk about when you talk about leadership, coach, it's one of the things that we talk about what makes a good leader. So one of the things was that as a coach, as a clarity coach, and as a as a Muay Thai coach. There's two things that we need to have that we need to present to the potential buyer, the potential client. And number one is that we're empathetic and we use words like, I understand what it's like to be X, Y, Z. The other thing is to, to say that I have authority in it. So my authority in the Muay Thai space is, is that, well, I've been doing this for 25 years. In 2014, I had a student go to the UFC, which is the highest level of mixed martial arts on the planet today. 
that presents authority. But the empathy, the empathy piece is what's really key here. Because even from a coaching client perspective, that's what we're looking for. We have to be empathetic towards that client because, you know, there's an old expression that says you have to eat a ton of salt with somebody before you really get to know them. That's right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and coach, and, just go ahead. Yeah, go go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say that uh, as a policing perspective, people are angry. So you have to think for them. People are afraid. You have to think for them. And we, not, we don't spend enough time on verbals. And we don't spend enough time criticizing people who refuse or don't know how to use verbals. And this is nothing new. This is nothing new. We used to do this all the time. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, we'll, that's we'll great. Say. There was a, there was a question a question from one of the one of the, the the audience that said, you know, thoughts on forced racism in community. I don't know that I understand the question, but maybe you do better than I. Coach, do you know what forced racism in communities is? No, if I if I interpret the question right, it's it's uh, dominance and control uh, forced on people. I, I don't know, but uh, this is where I say we turn it inward. Because my, the other side of my story is I I often ask people, no matter it could be Chinese, could be semi to the Jewish religion, could be uh, could be Europeans, say uh, okay, we're and, they, and they're expecting me to to say something. I say, well, I want to be like you. And they say, well, I want to be like you. I want to control my own areas of people activity whenever I can. Economics, education, entertainment, labor law, politics, religion, section war. Black Wall Street was an example. So don't say we can't do it. And people have said that to me, oh, you guys can't do that. So no, 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 hold on now, hold on now, we did it. But it was destroyed as it was, as it was uh, Shelburne, Nova Scotia, where I'm from. Largest uh, race riot in, uh, in, in, in North America. Uh, took place. Black people were doing great. Somebody got jealous or envious. Uh, same with uh, Rosewood, Florida. Same thing. We can do it. I want to do what you do. Because we're the only group that that does not do that. And it has disastrous results. You see, they say, well, uh, uh, what do women want? Well, women want women's rights. rights. That's what they want. What do gay people want? We want gay rights. What do black people want? We want civil rights. We want uh, um, uh, civil rights and, 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 and areas like that. So we don't say we want black rights. We want human rights. We want civil rights. We got to drag everybody with, no, no, I want to do what you're doing. You establish your own communities. You have your own stores. You get money turns around in the community three or four times. Uh, 13 times uh, in some cases, uh, up to 50 times in some cases. In the black community, it's four hours. See, we, we, don't, have, we don't have areas. Uh, we have neighborhoods. You know, there's a Greek area. There's a Portuguese area. There's these different areas. We have neighborhoods. We have to turn that around. Yeah, that's amazing, Coach. That's an amazing thing to 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 that i never sort of thought of it's true. yeah I, I'm, and I'm everybody's got anyone. areas you've got neighborhoods yeah i mean i'm not insulting anyone how can i insult someone when i say i want to be like you yeah of course Amazing. but there's pushback on that because if everybody has that opportunity who's going to do the work for the people who wish to maintain dominance and control And that's Amazing. a global thing. That's a global thing, indeed. Indeed, it is for sure. Coach, I, I have to say that I, I, I I'm saddened a little bit that we didn't get more because of our technology. But but I will tell you this: that uh, uh, I'd love to have you back, and I think that uh, I think that uh, it would be great to to cover a little bit more of your book. Believe it or not, Coach, it's like quarter to two already, so we're already we're already over. But I, I was so into this, and and I want to learn more, Coach. I really want to learn more and, and have you back and, and talk about this because it's a it's certainly an it's certainly an issue that that we still have. And I said at the beginning that as humans, we as species, we evolve very slowly. And it's kind of interesting that we start we start having these problems. I, I don't really quite get it. Um, but I hope that the energy changes. And so uh, and so 
what I hope is is that we can have you back here, coach, and we can talk a little bit further, uh, because I think I think this is such a, a powerful topic, and I think you're such a wonderful spokesperson for this because, you know, you you really first of all you have the experience, and you have your life experience, an entire life dedicated to, to you know, um, having to almost if you will go uphill the whole time. You know, that's that's an interesting statement, because I always sometimes say when in policing, I, I, you're walking into the wind. That's right. You, so you know, sometimes it's a blizzard. Whatever. Sometimes it's 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 a gale or a tornado. And other times it's just a, a breeze. But you're walking into the wind. Yeah. Yeah. So I use the expression walking uphill. OK, that's the same. You know? same uh, that's the same. You but know? Uh, well, I think I thank you for your kind words, and and we can do this anytime under any format. We can we can go sit in a coffee shop. Cops like donuts. yeah, man. You know, I would so love. I, mean, I would that, love. I, I would love with to the crowd. Hear more. Yeah, and I think I think that it'd be great. And I think that what I'd like to do too, Coach, is is that maybe maybe over the course of the next uh, uh, you know the next month or maybe before Christmas or on a special edition of the show and Putin Nation, if you're here with us, maybe what we can do is we can have both Calvin Lawrence and Ricky Atkinson on the show. Uh, that would be a great show, Coach, just to sort of hear different I perspectives. Would. You know, I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But long as he's long, <laughs> Josh, he's not chasing me. Long as he's not chasing. Me. <laughs> Just tell him leave his box of gloves at home. That's right. That's right. It's gonna be. We're gonna change the show, Coach. When you come on it to the coffee, biscotti, and donut show. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> that's awesome, Coach. I gotta say, what an absolute honor. I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties, but uh, I'm just really happy that I got to spend 90 minutes with you because you really are an amazing man, Coach. I loved you from the moment we met and the moment we got introduced. You really are a first-class guy, and I can't wait. Once a week, Coach, we're going to spend one hour, baby, one hour a week. <laughs> I got to learn from you, and, and, I'll, yeah. and I'll put you out there. You, 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 you've, you've got a lot of experience, and I want to I wanna learn some, pick up some stuff because I steal stuff, eh? I steal styles. So okay, if I can steal something from you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do it. So I'll, I'll, I'll do anything for you, okay? Thanks, brother. Thanks, Coach. All right. It means so much to me. Much love to you. I'm going to put you backstage, Coach. So stay where you are. Uh, I'm just going to give my final thoughts, and then I'll get back to you in a sec. All right. Thank you. Much love, Coach. Well, there you have it, folks. This one was challenging. But as Putin Nation writes in the chat, thank you, Coach, for persevering through the tech challenges uh, to be here with us today. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little speechless guys today, because again, I said this to you at the beginning of the show, maybe, maybe we won't have these experiences. We'll have our own trial and tribulation, but what about if everything that you did, like, like Calvin did was really walking into the wind that, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as, a as a as a, a native of of Nova Scotia and being one of the first black police officers in Nova Scotia, and then transferring to the RCMP and 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 you know going everywhere and having these experience and and doing all these wonderful things and still not being recognized uh, for the work that he's done. I mean, guys, that's that's. It just speaks and it speaks volumes to who Calvin really is as a person and how he, he persevered and how he was how he's determined. And that even at 72 years old, he's out there talking about it and wanting to make a difference. So I, I really am grateful for for Calvin and I'm great. I'm, I'm honored to call him a friend because he's uh, he really is a wonderful man. If you ever get a chance to come to Ottawa, uh, you make sure that uh, you let me know and we'll go have a coffee or a tea with my friend Calvin, because I got his personal line. So next week on the Coffee and Biscotti Show, the winner of the Governor General Award, Charles David Jones, also known as the Spider Jones. Uh, he's going to be here with us next week. Um, Guys, we got a heck of a lineup, man. I mean, we had Calvin Lawrence today. Uh, we got Charles David Jones, Spider Jones coming on next week. Uh, the uncle of Dwayne The Rock Johnson will be here. Uh, a beautiful goddess who's going to be with us in a couple of weeks, Catherine Tanaka. She's coming on the show, who's like a, a, a fitness expert and, and 
just the, the true embodiment of goddess energy. Uh, she will be with us. So we've got a lot of great people coming up on the Coffee and Biscotti Show. So I hope to see you here next week, 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And uh, look forward to seeing you then. Today, we are off to see DJ Ageless, who is a talented DJ from California. So if you're in the chat, stick around. Josh is going to rate us away to DJ Ageless. Make sure you're here next week for coffee and biscotti show from my heart to yours folks much love peace